I worked as a chef here for about five years. There have been many small stories, little things that have happened, and this is my most memorable experience. I stayed late one night during the week to clean some equipment that needed it pretty badly. Closer to the end of my extra hours, I had to finish up with some dishes and other minor things that moved through the dish pit. The door to the dishwasher from one of those older machines was actually semi-difficult to pull up. The slide part of the door had been beaten for years, so it was on the sticky side. You literally had to put a little muscle into it to raise it up. Sometimes it would even get stuck, so of course a couple bangs on the side and a thrust on the handle would usually do it. I was standing in front of it, I had a sense of eerie like someone was nearby, and bang! A flash lit up the sterling silver panels of the dishwasher. My immediate thought was that one of the late night drunks was messing with me, like a flash on a camera. I slammed the door shut and ran around the loop, from one kitchen exit to another, which took you through a hallway and around dining tables. No one was up there. I checked both bathrooms, both sides of the floor, nothing. But when I came back, the door to the dishwasher was open and water was spilling all over the floor. I mopped it, then continued cleaning to get the hell out of there. I'm ready to leave, so I'm almost there. Had to run one last set through, and I shut the dishwasher door down. I know it was down. I looked at it and even thought to myself, it's down. I went to the men's room to take a leak and returned to the kitchen, with the door open and water all over the floor. Let's just say... I did a shit mop job and bounced. It started when I was at my grandmother's house, getting it ready for sale slash for her to move. She had a deck overlooking her dock right on the river. Lovely view and place. I'm taking a sick break from cleaning on the deck overlooking the water. All of a sudden, I catch movement in the chair next to me and look over to see the typical Japanese onro spirit. She looked soaking wet, milk white skin, scraggly black hair covering her face and what seemed like a torn up black negligee skirt combo for clothes. I stare as long as I can but when I blink she's gone. I go in to tell my girl we're done for the day and we go home. This was a dark time in both our lives addicted to heroin and just self-destructing on each other. Well, shit got weirder once we got home and got high. It definitely wasn't the drugs making me see this shit, since it was an isolated incident in my addiction. Sometime later, we were in the bedroom sitting on the bed, when she ran out of the room to get something from another room. I finally look away from my computer to acknowledge her, and who's sitting on the edge of my bed looking at me? I assume. Couldn't see though her hair. My friend from grandma's porch. I was never able to see her feet either time, which struck out to me, because I judge most people, apparition or not, by their footwear. And even though we were within arm's reach, each time sitting diagonal from one another, as soon as I blinked, she disappeared. Once again, not wanting to freak the missus out, I decided to go cook dinner and try to push these experiences down to that take to the grave section of memories. So I got the George Foreman going, salad and bread is already plated, and just finishing up some sides, when I see my girl walk from the front room of our place, down the hall towards our bedroom. What caught my eye is when I saw her, she looked over her shoulder, giving me the fuck me eyes, and started to take her shirt off, as she got out of my line of sight. I quickly follow her to see her from behind, topless, and about to take her shorts off when she enters the room and out of my line of sight. Once I got into the room five seconds later, it was totally empty. At this point I scream out, Jessica, where the fuck are you? Were you just stripping for me in the hallway? And she yells back from the hallway bathroom, she's been taking a shit for the last ten minutes, and what the fuck am I talking about? I barge in the bathroom and unload everything I saw that day leading up to the doppelganger. She's thoroughly spooked and pissed a ghost is trying to seduce me. Some needed levity since she said I was white as a sheet. 
Later that week, she went to rehab without me because I had court problems and we broke up. My grandfather sold my trailer out from underneath me and kept the money. My step-grandpa died and I moved into the aforementioned grandma's house. Could never make heads or tails of the Onryo on doppelganger. Never felt evil or any maliciousness. Can't help but think she was a warning me about my now ex. And I got to learn the overwhelming amount of paranormal shit that goes on when you live on the water. A lot of stuff just passing by. Only one malicious entity, but that's a fucked up story for another time. And most of my friends had an experience while I lived there. But that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I was about eight years old. This was my first paranormal experience and still freaks me out to this day. My best friend had a wealthy grandmother in Essex, England. She had a three-story Victorian house, which I often stayed at. There was one time that I stayed there after school. It was around 5 p.m. and we were there alone waiting for her mum to pick us up. We were bored in the house and so we decided to have a look in the third floor cupboards. There were lots of random empty diaries and notebooks and we took them to the tree house that was at the end of the garden and played with them by writing rubbish in them and pretending to be bookkeepers, shopkeepers, etc. The tree house was like a five minute walk away from the back entrance. The backyard was huge. As we were playing in the little tree house, we both heard her mum's voice coming from the house saying, girls, girls, it's time to go. Come on and let me in. We didn't expect her for at least another hour, so this confused us both. We reluctantly walked through the backyard and into the house. We kept hearing, girls, girls, let me in. It's time to go home. There was also a loud banging on the front door. We were cautious and looked through the front window before we went to answer the door. And we noticed that her mum's car was not in sight and we couldn't see who was behind the door banging. We both freaked out and ran to hide upstairs in the third story wardrobe. The banging stopped after about five minutes, but we both stayed up there for a good half hour until my friend's brother came home and opened the front door himself. Has anyone ever had a similar experience? This entity had taken on the voice of my friend's mom and was asking us to let it in. And we almost did. Roughly three years ago in 2018, I had an experience so scary, I had to leave town shortly after it happened. It was a Thursday night at roughly 9 p.m. while I was in my room watching some Netflix on my bed. Just like any other school night, it wasn't anything special. It was going like any other normal day until I would hear faint sounds of a bird outside being attacked by some creature. Now, this could be seen as normal throughout the day where it would be being eaten by a cat. But at 9 p.m., even I knew that was strange. It went on for a few minutes of struggle until there was a sudden crack and then silence, as if the bird was being toyed with. Although this may seem suspicious, I shrugged it off as I really couldn't care less about a random ass bird on Thursday. A quick note before I go further, I live in an old house built in World War II for the workers of the airfield nearby. These houses are not big for today's standard, meaning I could hear anything going on inside my house. Near these houses is a field with holes left from bombing runs in the war, and where houses once were are currently parking spaces for the flats built over the old runway. Anyway, a couple hours went by from the bird incident, when suddenly I heard a thud downstairs, as if someone or something had fallen over. The thing with this was that my parents were both in bed sleeping. I did what I thought any sane person would do and went downstairs to investigate. And what I found was not what I was expecting. Lying there on the floor was the lifeless body of a crow with its wings widely spread out across the floor. This freaked me out as all the doors and windows were locked. So I had no clue how it got in, especially in that position. At this point, 
I was quite freaked out. So I put the bird in a bag and laid it on the table. I was too spooked to go into the pitch black garden to throw it out. So it was there, ready for the morning. This one coward's act of mine could be the one which saved my life. Once I made my way upstairs and into my room, I was very cautious of my surroundings. I would keep looking in the corner of my room in case someone was there. Hours go by of me laying in my bed, watching Netflix in my dark room. When I looked up and could have sworn that I saw a shadowy figure with no certain outline, which I could only describe as being similar to the red face guy from Insidious. I quickly got my phone and shined my light in the corner to see what it was. But as I did it, disappeared into thin air, confusing and scaring the heck out of me. At this point, it was 3am and I hadn't slept yet. Usually, I would be asleep by 1 or 2am, but there was no way I was sleeping that night. Only a few minutes after I saw the figure, I heard tapping on my window, which is two stories up. I went to check the windows, but no one was there. There was no way that this was a person who would climb up the side of my house, which took out the possibility that I was being played with by a friend. This was the point at which I knew something paranormal was occurring. After the tapping, I turned on my light and turned up my Netflix to full volume to make myself feel more comfortable. Even with the high volume on Netflix, I hear yet another set of tapping on my window. So once again I check, but this time it's different. On the road in front of my house, I see a person waving up to me. I got to the window within five seconds of tapping, so there's no way he climbed down and ran across my garden onto the road in that time. This freaked me the fuck out, so I closed my curtains and lay down in my bed. Bam! Out of nowhere, I hear the loudest crash I've ever heard just outside of my window. An orange glow lit up my window as I hear screaming coming from below where the person waving once was. I raced to the window to see what happened when I set my eyes on the most horrific sight I had ever seen. Two cars turned to one as they collided and have both been set on fire with one of the drivers still alive in the blaze, screaming, trying to get out. The other races to the other driver, trying his hardest to get him out. I rushed outside to help burn my right hand in the process. Only a few minutes later, the orange colour which lit onto the houses was met with flashing blue lights as an ambulance arrived on scene. At this point, the driver, who was alive, was taken to the hospital in a bad state. The other driver was long gone. His body had turned into charcoal like that on a barbecue. The one who was taken to the hospital had inhaled too much smoke, so I didn't have a chance to talk with him about what happened. I knew that this happening shortly after what had happened to me was no coincidence. The crash happened dead on where the man waving at me stood. The creepiest thing about the cars and the crash is that one of them was so long gone in the fire that the car and the person were completely unidentifiable. I just knew something was up. I didn't get a wink of sleep throughout that night. I was so shocked about what happened that I took the next week off school, but even that didn't help me. Every time I would look outside or leave the house, I would think of that night. It drove me insane. The incident was put onto the newspaper where it said the survivor went into a coma because of his injuries. This got even worse. A few weeks passed as I'm slowly getting back to normal until one night. I overheard my mum talking to her friend about that night. Her friend said she also saw a shadow figure in her room when she went to get a drink of water and then tapping at the window. This was the moment I knew it was paranormal. This was two days before the survivor of the crash woke up from his coma. So at this point, I had no clue what was coming. When I heard my mum talking to her friend, I shot up and went to the hospital where the survivor was. I requested his family to call me when he was in a stable state so I could ask him about how the crash happened. It was a long shot, I know, but I had to know what had happened that night. A couple days later, I got a call telling me he was up and in a stable state so I got a bus to the hospital. On the way, I looked out of the window 
and I saw a total of four people staring into the bus with no expression, like I was being watched. This got me in the same state as that horrendous night. Once I arrived at the hospital, I entered the survivor's room and asked, how exactly did the crash happen? I was only going 35 miles an hour, until out of nowhere, I saw a man standing in the middle of the road, waving at some random house. He was right in front of me, so I did what anyone else would do and swerved out of the way. Once I swerved out of the way, my car suddenly stopped like I crashed, but I saw nothing in front of me. No lights, no trees, nothing. So you saw no other car? No. Only once I saw the flames did I see the crumbled up car, but that wasn't the weirdest part of the crash. Only once I got a good look of what happened, I saw some sort of shadow standing on the roof being engulfed in flames. At that moment, my eyes widened as I realized the dark spots by his neck on his gown, similar to that of the man waving at my house. I busted out of the room and ran as fast as I could toward the bus stop. As I was running, I turned back to see a man, possibly the survivor, in a window waving down at us. This was the last straw. I got home as fast as possible. I screamed at my mum, saying we need to leave as soon as possible, and explained it all to her. I stayed at my grandparents' house while my parents moved out of our house. This took a couple of months. I'm always keeping an eye out on that figure in every dark corner. I'm always watching. However, this is not something which has helped me recently. The reason I'm saying all of this now is because something else has happened to me recently and I don't know what to do. The date is currently August 15th, 2021. Once again, a bird appeared in my house with its wings spread out. I'm beyond frightened and don't know what to do. I am now just waiting for another crash to happen or more waving people. There's one thing I know for sure though. My plan worked. It was around this time of year, during a frigid and icy winter. I was traveling alone in my minivan, coming back from visiting a friend who lived out in the country. I've never been fond of driving alone as I get lonely, and I guess the best word to use is jumpy. Around this time, there was zero traffic on the road with me. It was a rural highway, and aside from the occasional farmhouse, no notable landmarks in the area. I don't remember exactly when it happened, but suddenly I became very aware of something that there was with me at some point. I could swear I felt a heavy presence somewhere in the back seat. This sort of heavy, ominous feeling of dread just came awash over me, and I remember feeling suddenly emotionally overwhelmed. Breathing became laboured and difficult. I finally dared myself to look in my mirrors to convince myself it was nothing. I recall seeing this blurry, dark mass. I should note, there wasn't anything special about that, as my vehicle doesn't have much interior lighting to begin with. But I've never felt more watched than I did at that moment, gazing into the nothingness in the rear seat. If you have ever felt like you were feeling morbid thoughts, not your own, I sincerely hope you never do, because it was as unpleasant as it sounds. While I kept driving, in between watching the road and keeping an eye on the back seat, I kept hearing these phrases. Death is near, death is coming, it is near, death is here with you. Those four phrases, just over and over. I was shaking uncontrollably. I can't explain why, but I have already noted the feeling of dread. Only it became so much more robust in those final moments before it happened. Just when I felt it could take it no longer, I looked out the windshield in time to see brake lights. Somehow, a vehicle had appeared, almost as if from nowhere. The road was icy, and I knew at that moment that I did not have time or distance enough to avoid their pickup truck. So I hit my brakes and went to steer away from the other vehicle, sending mine into a spin. I spun entirely around twice before coming to a stop and not having hit the ditch or the truck and I remember feeling the heaviness dissipate. Finally, I regained control of my emotions and made it home safely. I've experienced many anxiety attacks before, 
and this was nothing like those whatsoever. I genuinely feel that in those moments, I wasn't alone. I don't have much in the way of theories for what happened that night, only that I was warned of an impending crash that could have cost me my life moments before it took place. I don't know what's going on, and I feel like I'm going crazy. The first time this happened was a few years ago, when my dad subscribed to Netflix for the first time. So I started watching Cell, and I didn't know what it was based on a Stephen King book, because in Spanish, I'm Argentinian, the book is called Cell, and the movie is called El Pulso. I started watching it and thought, oh, it's like this movie I watched a few years ago. Maybe it's the remake. I googled it, and that movie never existed. Let me explain. I saw this Cell movie in 2017, and it was released in 2016. But when I was in high school, like in 2013 or 14, I remember vividly watching another Cell movie on YouTube that was quite old because they were using old phones, like the Motorola ones that came in different colors. And I even remember details. A young John Cusack was starring it, and I remember this because when I watched the 2016 version, I also thought that was really cool that he was doing the remake. The character that played Samuel L. Jackson was played by another white actor that looked like the old man that appears in the old Pet Cemetery movie. And I remember watching this old Cell movie on my aunt's computer in my grandparents' house. I remember that it started with Cusack driving in a hallway. When something happens and when he gets down of his car, he sees this two girls buying a hot dog. One had this green old Motorola full of stickers and the other girl had a similar cell phone, but in pink. And I remember this because I thought the phones were really cool and I wanted one. And then the one with the green cell phone attacked the other. A woman fell, everything was chaos, and Cusack went back to his car. I also remember that at the end, he escapes with his son and the final scene is of them both walking down on train tracks. I remember it so clearly, but it's hard to explain. I remember that it was in parts and in bad quality. And I remember getting a little mad because I was liking the movie, but not the fact that it was segmented in parts and in poor quality. When I Googled this old Cell movie and I couldn't find it, and then I read on Wikipedia that the 2016 one was the first and only adaptation of this book, I felt like I was going crazy. I couldn't believe it. A few weeks or months later, while I was cleaning my bookcase, I found out that I had the book. I have a small Stephen King collection that my mum gave me as a gift, but I don't really like him as a writer, so I haven't read all the books. I started reading Cell and realized that the beginning was exactly like the old movie I watched and apparently didn't exist. So at first I thought that maybe I read the book and mistook it for a movie. But first, I didn't remember that I had it. And second, I'm autistic and my special interest is books. I remember every book I read, and I'm pretty sure I never read Cell while in high school. I didn't think much about it. This story became an anecdote, and everything was cool, until a similar thing happened to me a few days ago. A few months ago, I started following a band called Whiplash. I thought they were Chilean, and I'm pretty sure they were because I started following them before they debuted. And when they did, and I listened to their first songs, they had a Chilean accent. I also remember watching their TikToks, and in a trend where they present themselves, they put the Chilean flag. I also recommended them to some friends as this new Chilean band. And then, when I listened to their last song a few days ago, all of a sudden they're Mexican, and they've always been. I started feeling really sick. I was hurt, and I had to rest in my bed all day. I don't know what happened. It felt so surreal. I don't know if this matters, but I live in the Florida Panhandle, Penascola, Destin area. There are some places where I live that are considered active in paranormal activity. And growing up here, I've experienced some shit that just doesn't make any damn sense, no matter how much sense I try to make of it. I consider myself a very logical and rational person. I don't scare easily, 
and like to assess a situation before jumping to conclusions. With that said, I'm also not religious and I'm not a firm believer in the paranormal. I am open-minded and understand that some weird shit that can happen and it's better left alone. I'm a very light sleeper. I live in a nice neighborhood with mostly retired folks and the houses aren't close together. So there's no way I'd be able to hear what I heard from a neighbor. With that said, I woke up around 2.30 a.m. to the distinct sound of a baby's laughter in my room. The only people in this house are me and my son, who's 18 and has his own room. I know what his laugh sounds like, and it sure as shit wasn't this. Hearing this woke me up immediately, and several seconds following it, my son comes into my room and asks if I heard it too, so I know I wasn't just hearing things. Naturally, we were a little freaked out and I grab my firearm that I keep on my nuts and he grabs his own and we sweep the house. Nothing. We checked under the beds, the living room, all closets and corners, the fucking garage. Not one damn thing. No other TVs were on, no music was playing. Nothing. It was dead ass quiet. So what in the actual fuck? Anyone else experienced this shit? So all throughout my life, focusing on more recent events in the past, I've been able to make shockingly accurate predictions about events within the next few minutes to hours. This has happened to me more than a few times, enough so that my friends in college had a running joke about it. I say predictions because I'm not sure what other word to use. In college, I majored in physics and statistics. So I have a pretty thorough understanding of biases and likelihood of certain events. On that note, one of the best examples I have of repeating predictions in a short frame was playing a dice game with my friends in college. Objective of the game is not important, but what is important is everyone is in a circle rolling two dice in turn. We were all having fun and joking around, so I started trash talking, which makes no sense for a game of complete chance and calling out the number pairs other people would roll. Funny thing was, I was getting it exactly right over and over again. It spooked the hell out of one of my friends who was actually paying attention, and she started counting. All in all, I got 38 correct dice predictions in a row, only stopping when the game ended. The rational part of my brain says I was just getting lucky and having a good time, but the much quieter part of my brain knows I wasn't. There was an odd feeling each time I would call a number pair. It's difficult to describe other than assured or confident. And not like misplaced confidence, more like actually knowing to the point where any other outcome would be ridiculous. What do you guys make of this? It happened a ton, but like the dice incident was my clearest example of it continuously happening on individual events where I had no control of the outcome. I'll preface this by saying I was very, very young at the time. I'm 20, male, trans dude, which sort of matters for context later. I think I would have been seven to nine and I was a big fan of ghost hunters. I had this cringy ass tap shirt I'd wear with pride after we went to a ghost store in St. Augustine. I live in Florida and my fam wanted to go on a little vacation to St. Augustine. I'm sure any paranormal lovers out there are familiar with the location. It's been featured on a few of those popular ghost shows quite a bit. We initially went to just eat seafood and see the lighthouse and stuff, but there were a bunch of nighttime the ghost tours advertised. Anyways, we went. At first it was a bit cheesy like all ghost tours were. They really hyped up the events of what happened. I can't remember the exact name of the location. I'm sure you could find it if you looked it up but they were telling us about three little girls who would play with this mini rail in the back of the house. Basically, the train malfunctioned and the girls got trapped in the carriage and unfortunately drowned. We got past the touring part and they did this thing where they completely turned off the lights in the house and let you just sort of wander around and see if you could get any activity. 
I remember I was with this immediate feeling of dread. The house just felt very heavy. I chalk it up to me being younger than even a preteen, and I got scared easily. Still, it's interesting to note. After the tour, my dad, mom, and brother all decided they wanted to check out that park where the girls drowned without a bunch of other people there. I was super against it, freaked out, and wanted to go home. I ended up just clinging to my dad the entire time. My brother and mom went off on their own, and me and my dad sat on a little park picnic table. It was completely dark as it was a rather large area, and the trees blocked most of the light pollution from streetlights, etc. My dad had gotten his phone out and began recording while I sat with him. He asked a few innocent questions like, is anyone there? Feel free to talk to us, etc. Just generic ghost hunter rhetoric he had seen on TV. Me and my dad weren't really having much happen. Still, the area just had a certain feel about it. We went to check on my mom, who was sweating and she heard whispering around her. My brother had caught this video on his old flip phone of an orb by a street lamp. I don't personally believe in orbs or find them interesting at all, but this stood out since it was much brighter than the lamp it was next to, and it floated into the sky before completely disappearing. Weird stuff. It was getting pretty late and I kept pestering them to leave. So we went back to the car and my dad listened back to his phone recording. He let out this sort of nervous chuckle and we all just looked at him and asked what, since my dad is the type of dude to not really be shaken by much. He said he picked up a voice on the phone. It was a little girl, basically whispering. The words train track were heard very clearly, followed by the voice just repeating train over and over again, very quietly. It was incredibly unnerving, especially after knowing what had happened in the area. At this point, I'm practically begging my family to drive us back to the hotel. They had all asked me if I was doing it, since at the time I was a little girl with a fairly high-pitched voice, considering my age and all. I absolutely don't remember saying that though, and also, why would I just say the word train repeatedly? After we left, I think we picked up a few other things, like just slight whispers, but it was hard to tell due to how shitty phone speakers were at the time. It was one of a few notable paranormal events I've had happen in my life though, and the voice recording in particular always stuck with me. It was on an old flip phone slash duke phone that I don't think we have anymore, but I'll definitely try to find it and post it here. So yeah, that's it. Just figured I'd share it here since it was always pretty interesting.